how does an unknown carpenter living in rural Tauranga get himself noticed? In the first year or perhaps almost two years, I would literally be going down to Bunnings and irritating the staff there by pulling out 15 sheets of pine ply, uh, searching for the best sheets I could find. Welcome back to another episode of A Kiwi Original. Today on the show, I'm joined by Matt McMillan, who is the founder and managing director for Maker Design Studio. This is a company that specializes in lighting accessories. These are the lamps, pendants, uh, all of those types of things that either beautifies your home environment or your corporate environment. And the fascinating thing with all of these products is that Matt is super keen on manufacturing, not just in New Zealand, but in Tauranga, New Zealand, and is a relatively new business to buy New Zealand made. So uh, welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you very much, Ryan. Good to be here. Now you joined uh, NZ Made only quite recently in the last month or so, but you've been manufacturing in Tauranga since what, 2014? Yeah, that's right. Um, started the idea for the business in late 2013 and the design for the lamps was developed during 2014 and finally on the market towards the end of 2014 yeah what got you started in the uh, lighting business what what did you see that wasn't existing uh, already yeah it's a good question um the lighting was really um, one part of a strategy that I had. Uh, I was trying to make a, a leap from being a, in, a, in a paid job to striking out on my own uh, with my background in cabinet making and carpentry. And really my idea was to, uh, to go into making high-end uh, furniture, one-off pieces I was really thinking in terms of. And... Uh, I was sort of grappling with the problem of how does an unknown carpenter living in rural Tauranga um, get himself noticed enough for people to buy furniture at that kind of price band. Um, and the, the idea for lighting was originally just one idea that I thought would be a good way to get noticed. Um, I thought that they lent it, the, the idea of doing feature pendant lighting lent itself well to uh, doing something a bit artistic, uh, perhaps a bit sculptural, uh, and obviously, um, you know, it, it's a feature rather than a particularly utilitarian item. And it can also be put in a box and shipped around the country relatively easily compared to something like a dining table or a sideboard or something like that. So it was quite strategic in that sense. Uh, I hadn't ever dreamt of becoming a light maker or heavily involved in lighting. I've always appreciated lighting, good lighting. Uh, it's, always, it's always mattered to me how a room is lit. Um, but I never actually anticipated going professionally into that realm at all. So it was quite a surprise to me, actually. <laughs> yeah. And since that point, uh, so, you know, you're saying that this was almost a, a segue, this is a way to build your reputation to then mm. sell the one-off pieces, the, the bespoke, you know, very high-end and draw on that cabinet making. Did you ever get to that point? <laughs> I'm still uh, I'm still on the road <laughs> trying to get to that point. Uh, every year I say this is the year I'm going to push on some new designs and actually get back in the workshop and produce some uh, furniture or, or household items. And uh, I guess fortunately for me, um, the reason I haven't is that the lighting has gone that well that it's just really kept me so busy. I haven't had time to. Yeah. What do you think has, has caused that um, that support for the lighting uh, lamps and pendants that you're making? Well, I think um, uh, I'd have to recognise uh, in the industry other other designers, uh, particularly noteworthy would be David Truebridge. Uh, he has, uh, you know, cut the cut the path for 
particularly timber uh, lighting and definitely he was an inspiration his work was an inspiration to me i could i could see that he was onto something uh with his lighting so that was um an inspiration and and, and also um a flag that there was a market there that people were were buying um good quality uh aesthetically stunning uh lighting at, at that kind of price point which was news to me i mean i had never uh, entertained buying anything at, at that level already so uh, i didn't know that other people did <laughs> yeah and what was it like when you you saw that support in the the orders that you were getting either online or through the the retailers that were su supporting your products um, well, I mean, it, it was initially a huge surprise, really. Um, uh, to be honest, I think for the first two or three years, I regularly uh, sort of thinking I might wake up from this and find that I've just got to get up and go to my job again tomorrow. <laughs> my old job, that is. Um, uh, so it, it was quite a surprise, uh, quite how how well they were taken up i mean it, it was it, there was a curve to the build absolutely but um at each point of the capacity that i was able to back to um there was plenty of ready ready uptake for them um and um yeah obviously i was very very Sort of flattered by that, I suppose, um, and felt very lucky really that uh, it was really the very first design that I'd come up with, and that it had hit the ground running, you know, so so effectively. So, um, yeah, that was. It's great quite, when you get that validation, isn't it, from you know paying customers that aren't friends and family that that takes it beyond uh, potentially a hobby, and then you've got these other things to grapple with, like uh, should I make more of this one or should I design new ones? Uh, and when you decide one of those paths, you're really deciding what you're going to do for the next few months. Uh, what is involved with the actual making process of the the pendants and lamps that you make? Yeah, well, the the making process has evolved, as you can imagine, um, as the as over the years as the volume has grown. Uh, but it, I, I started Maker very much um, on a shoestring. Um, we were on a very tight budget. We'd agreed as a family that I would take the time out to try and make this business run. So I had sort of time on my hands, but we didn't have a lot of capital and we were not planning to borrow money to make it work. So it was done um, really very on a shoestring in the beginning. Um, so the manufacturing was, was completely hand done by me. Um, in the first year or perhaps almost two years, I would literally be going down to Bunnings and irritating the staff there by pulling out 15 sheets of their um, ply, pine ply, uh, searching for the best sheets I could find with no knots in it and uh, so on, and then racking them all back up again and walking away with one or two sheets. Um, and bringing those back and literally I had made jigs, uh, circular jigs and a hand router to cut out the rings. Uh, I had to, I had to really upskill actually my own woodworking skills to even get close to the kind of standard that we're at now with the, with the product, uh, cutting such thin components for the fins, for example, um, is not, is not, as easy as it might sound um, to get a nice even finish. Um, and it, it, even to the extent of uh, wetting down the, the plywood sheets to blow out the grain and then sanding them to get a nice clean finish um, because the, the plywood originally in the, in the first year or so was, was not the kind of grade of plywood that we're now using. It was a, a, a cheaper grade and that's why I had to be so involved in sort of hand selecting each sheet that I was satisfied with it. Um, so that 
that was really how it was for the first year to approaching two years. Um, I had never um, been involved in manufacturing as such before. All my work previously had been one-off uh, built-in work or you know, custom-made pieces. Um, so the idea of a, a sort of product design and such repeat design was a, was a new thing for me uh, that I had to get my head around. And the idea at, at each point, the idea of spending money on uh, outsourcing was, was terrifying. I just thought that that would, it would elevate the price to a point that people would no longer buy it. You know, the idea of keeping this thing produced in New Zealand, um, but not necessarily in my back shed was, it just seemed impossible. So it was a learning curve for me to discover that um, at each point that uh, when I found a local manufacturer that could initially, the first thing they did was to start ripping up the sheet supply with into the very narrow fins that are the main feature of, of, of our design. Um, uh, that after an initial cost of paying them to do some CAD work and some trial and error work, um, it became obviously it saved me a lot of donkey work and it became quite price efficient. And it also forced me to uh, consider paying a lot more for the plywood itself um, because once you're paying the cost of the machining, it, 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 you don't want to be having half of that material no good because it's a, a poor quality material which previously i might have just scrapped but with the investment of it you know the machine doesn't stop cutting up that sheet of plywood when it hits a, a bad patch it just cuts it all up so you'd be left with a lot of bad bits um and again i was terrified of um using more expensive material i thought that would increase the price uh, but I just found each for these things, for example, just showed me that at each point, uh, at every point of elevating the quality and the process of production, um, you ended up with a, a better product, a better finish, a more efficient process, mm -hmm. and you, you had you had savings in waste, for example, um, and savings in labour because the amount of time finishing which I still do, you still do hand finish each light, uh, is reduced because the, the, the base material is already good, you know. Um, and I, don't, so, I, don't think, I don't think you're alone in that either. I think there are a lot of business owners that recognize the advantages when you're starting of doing everything yourself because you get to control the quality, but also you get to learn about the materials and what's possible and really refine what the product's going to be. The mm. trouble is then replicating it for the second and the third or the 200th and 300th, and then deciding, well, what am I happy to let go of? It's substantially more because you've got to pay someone else's either wages and overheads uh, when, you, when you outsource. Uh, and will they do the same level of quality? And then you've got a different problem, right? Which is now I've really got to sell this certain amount because I've committed volumes to to this business. When was right for you to do that along your, so you started in 2014, it's 2020 now, so there's a kind of six years worth. Um, mm. At what point uh, did the, at what point did it push you to do this or what, at what point did you decide I should get ahead of this to make my life easier? Yeah. Um I think after the first year, I was getting to the point where uh, instead of it, instead of the orders um, taking up, you know, I, 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 to, to get one or two orders a week uh, would have been common for the first year or so. Um, so in among uh, playing around with other products at the time and managing, we live on a lifestyle block, so there's a bit of work to do around here. So I would do a bit of this and a bit of that and go and make a light. And as time went on, my time making the lights just got more and more pr proportionally larger. Um, and I realized that I was becoming a, a sort of a slave to my own 
factory, as it were, you know. Um, and so I did start to think about that late in 2015. Uh, started to think about how to resolve that. It felt like a very, and it still is really a very um, and sort of nuanced product. It, it's not a, a sort of paint by numbers process. It, there are lots of little techniques to get this thing right. And because it's visually very simple, um, if it's not right, it's very apparent. Um, so they, they need to be good and finding someone who can do that um, is a challenge. Um, and and it is also quite repetitive work, so it needs to be someone that's that's happy to do that kind of thing. It's a certain uh, mindset that, that can do that, enjoys listening to the radio or thinking their own thoughts or listening to music and is happy to keep... I, I can do that myself to quite a large degree. I'm quite happy in that, but not everyone is, you know, so it needs to be... The right person uh so that was step one um uh, at that stage i was still uh, cutting everything myself um cutting the rings with a router and so on towards the end of 2015 moving into 2016 20, 2015 actually um brought um pip with who's an old friend of ours uh on um I knew she had the right kind of uh, attention to detail um, and sort of finesse. I put, well, I felt confident that she did, and it turned out to be true. Um, so that was uh, that was great from the beginning. Uh, took a load of work off off my hands after the initial sort of training and uh, getting up to speed period. And uh, but at that stage, yeah, everything was still sliced up by me. Um, so there was a, an awful lot of, of donkey work to be done still. Um, so that, that was the next thing to resolve. And it, it just went really piece by piece, one slow step at a time. Uh, what would happen if I got uh, someone locally with a CNC machine to cut the fins? How would that hit the price point? We did a trial that worked well. And then gradually uh, over the course of that year and the following year, we added in uh, the cutting of the rings, which form the main sort of skeleton of the lights, as it were, um, uh, and and gradually more and more components. And then over the following years, obviously, um, the diversity of the range grew as well. So we moved into not just the round ones, but uh, more rectilinear shapes and and now even a more freeform shape. And each of those have presented problems, but uh, the technology and the CNC and the CAD work has, has been an important part of enabling that development, really. Um, so it was a gradual, you know, sort of dipping my toe in at each step, consolidating that that, that worked okay. Uh, and then looking at the next horizon and at each you know during all of these processes um uh the 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 volume was growing naturally just organically really um so they needed to happen almost simultaneously with the natural process of me exploring the next horizon as it were you know in terms of the manufacturing it's that um, balancing isn't it between what you can achieve if you decide to tweak the manufacturing process tweak who does what uh, and the scale of what you're expecting and i think that's yeah. the hard part is you you look at your sales for the previous year or quarter and think well that was good that would enable us to do x y and z if it continues mm. but you're not sure it might have just you're not been, sure. you're not sure. So I, I think what's made, uh, the, the, I've taken really quite a, a safe model here where all, all, our, all our lights are made to order. So um, I, I order material and components, not much ahead of what I know we've had ordered. You know, we have a lead time up to four weeks. So I can more or less order 
I mean, I, you know, as time has gone on and I'm confident of sales, I, that has grown. I, I order more than, I order some stock now in terms of components. But um, for a long time, it was really ordering piecemeal, you know, virtually exactly what I needed. So at, at any given point, um, I wasn't having really to spend or invest money um, that I wasn't pretty confident had, had already been sold effectively. Um, so, uh, you know, I still feel very fortunate that we've gone down a road where there's virtually no fixed costs uh, to the to the business. And I think um, for, for a small boutique industry uh, like our one, um, based in New Zealand, relying on New Zealand manufacturing at, at New Zealand manufacturing labor costs, that certainly for me was something that was that had to be achieved it had to be done um it's in, a smart way of doing way. things because mm. you're you've taken there an organic growth model uh, which is to yes. only in, invest as you know the business will support it with consistent sales you may forego some larger revenue but you also minimize or mitigate the risks of not reaching those forecasts uh, so it allows you to make sure that you're always paying yourself along the way rather than waiting for a for a larger payday that may or may not come down the road. Absolutely, yeah. And it, and it feels very solid. It feels like you're literally adding bricks as you go along. Um, and you're not being forced to make business choices or... Uh, compromise the product in any way because you're trying to reach or you know financial targets or pay back a huge loan to the bank or um, so on uh, so you know it has enabled me to, to to not just keep the quality but actually improve the quality um, over the course of time um, uh, but very much from just my own desire to do that rather than um, having to fulfill some kind of financial obligation or, uh, or or business plan as such. Um, so that has definitely worked well for this business. Not, it, you know, not every business can, can do that. You know, some mm. businesses require capital input. Um, but, you know, I, I chose not to, um, for example, rent uh, commercial space in town and buy my own CNC machine and employ a CAD designer, um, which I could have done and no doubt it would be more profitable, um, but there would have been, it would have been a very different business had I done that and it would have been shaped by the financial commitments, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in a different way. Yeah. It takes the pressure off and I, and I think for designers, creators, artists, or when you're in those first few years of business, it takes the pressure off. And there's a lot of other pressure that you have uh, of either learning new making techniques or learning the whole go-to-market, uh, how to excite or engage with consumers in a world that didn't exist 10 mm. years ago. You know, the whole uh, direct-to-consumer um, growth is, is something that's new to a lot of manufacturers. So. I think yeah. that's one of the advantages for a business like yours who has formed in the last decade is that it, it's all you've ever known. Yeah, well, I think definitely a lot of uh, sort of creative-based businesses, um, a, a lot of creatives, artists, artisan-type uh, businesses are often not uh, that well-versed or that inclined towards the business side or the marketing side of their own businesses um and to keep it streamlined and to keep sort of i suppose true to your um aesthetic and your creative uh aspects you you know it's important to have enough time if you if it's going to work you also have to have enough time to learn you know i knew nothing about the retail business i knew nothing about um business as such as a whole um 
And it was when a friend suggested to me to perhaps go to the Chamber of Commerce and approach them about their business mentoring program. Um, you know, I just took this advice. I took advice from people, you know, friends who are in business said, you know, try this, try that. And I did those things and they always helped. They were always useful. I had a mentor for a year from uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and again, very low cost, you know, the, a small initial fee. Um, uh, and that was well, well worth it, money well spent. And it completely upskilled me uh, in terms of business, my approach to business, I suppose. Sorry to interrupt. This won't take long. Subscribe to the show and you'll never miss another one of these amazing episodes. Right back to the show. Um, Was that through the New Zealand Business Mentors Scheme? That's right. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah. been one of those mentors before for a, a relatively new business. And y yeah. you can shortcut the potential mistakes rather than direct the business. You can just help a, an owner avoid potholes that maybe you've seen before that, yes. are, that are generic um, and, but easy to fall into. Yeah, I think that was very useful for me. And also it was really just having this sort of monthly, uh, roughly approximately monthly meeting on a very casual basis. And uh, it gave, you know, we would discuss a particular uh, aspect that or, or, or um, goal to fulfill. And it was, you know, when, when you work on your own, it's quite nice to have someone external that you sort of have to report to <laughs> and say, well, I have done this or uh, I haven't because this happened or I tried to do it, but it didn't work. Um, it's that accountability, you know, isn't it? It's a bit of accountability in a way, in a very friendly, informal way. But it, for me, it made a big difference. To, it was a good driver. Yeah. Switching on to the, the customer side of things, uh, how are customers buying? So uh, are they buying uh, for their whole house? Is it a renovation? Is it a new build? Or is it existing homes that, um, that you've managed to, to reach the owners somehow through your, your marketing? Um, yeah, it, it's all of those, really. Um, and again, uh, as time goes on, I've become more involved in the marketing of, of our work. But uh, again, I was very fortunate in the beginning um, to be, I suppose, to be involved with a product that is so visual um, mm. that it, it really has sold itself to, to a high degree. Um, but within that, I would have to recognize um, you know, the very first, the biggest hurdle in the first place, of course, was, was finding a, shop that would disseminate disseminate this product you know who, who, who's gonna you know who's, who's gonna, gonna see this thing? Who, who's, who's gonna, gonna back you yeah who, who, who's gonna yeah does anyone like it um and once again a friend of mine said oh you know have you heard of uh, the clever design store you should you should try them now the clever design store for anyone who doesn't know was the first um online platform uh, solely online platform in New Zealand that was exclusively at the time, at least, uh, promoting uh, New Zealand artists, artisans and designers. Um, so they were uh, uh, an obvious choice that I didn't know about until they were suggested to me. Um, and I went to visit them with uh, my very first two or three lamps, gave them a call, showed them some photos, and they invited me up, Paul, Paul at the Clever Design Store. And he liked the product um, and was willing to, to take them on. Now, for an online shop, that literally meant just taking a few photos and getting them up on the website. But of course, uh, particularly his business being at the time, really, I think the only one that was exclusively New Zealand um artisans artifacts and so on all new zealand made uh attracted journalists um for magazines and so on uh, particularly for those sort of uh, what's hot pages you know 10 new things this month and that kind of thing and uh it wasn't long after paul had taken on the lights that um i got a phone call from a friend of ours who'd just been on a flight from wellington back to Tauranga 
she was really excited and she said oh my god i've just seen your lights in the in-flight magazine (laughs) and i didn't even know i didn't even know they were in it um so that marketing was done uh completely out of my hands um and was obviously a, a great boost uh, there's a so, clear path there too though like the that you selected a place that ended up being the type of place that those who want to see what the next level of creativity and design uh, and who's producing Zealand. it in New Zealand goes yeah. to and then reports back through their own channels which happens to be the uh, Air New Zealand magazine, Koru yeah, magazine. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that was a, that was a great scoop, obviously, and and uh, I was hugely, um, you know, over the moon. Uh, quite early on in the process, my wife had said to me, you know, well, you know, what would su- success look like for you? Um, what, what, uh, what would that be um, to give me some kind of goal? And I said, well, and this wasn't just to do with the lights. This was to do with any any of my other furniture or design ideas um and i, I had a, a few things and i said well i suppose you know if, if i had to work in say a public place like a library or a um hotel foyer or something like that that would that would feel like success that would be you know not good recognition uh perhaps uh, in a magazine that would be good um and so, so one of those at least was fulfilled very early on. You know, I was completely blown away by that. Um, and again, you know, it wasn't, I didn't even know it was in the magazine until my friend phoned me up. And said she'd seen it. So it was quite funny, really. Um, but, but yeah, I, I'm eternally grateful to, to Paul and the Clever Design Store for the initial leg up. And really, um, similarly, the first, other shops that approached, uh, they approached me. They'd seen them really via his website um, and approached me to to take on some stock and display as well. So for the first year or so, it just was completely organic. The product sold itself and uh, I had to put very little effort or money, certainly no money, into the marketing at all so that's perhaps quite an unusual um story um and i think that that's largely due to the the visual easy sell of the actual product itself you know um obviously instagram now things like instagram and facebook to some extent um are lend themselves very well to that kind of marketing as well for this product very much so yeah, yeah. I've got a friend in uh, London who uh, manufactures LED light bulbs uh, and creates very unusual designs uh, that then get picked up by the design magazines. He takes them to the Mm. the design events. They're in Harvey Norman and Harrods and and all of those places who who care down to the design of the the actual bulb, not just Mm. the the lamp. the second part of the, those life goals you were just talking about there, when was the first time that you saw your product in a public space and went, wow, that's <laughs> amazing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I often don't see them. Uh, they go because they go around the country and overseas. Um, I often don't even know where they go. I think the first time I became aware that they had gone somewhere that um, I was sort of quite proud of was was an order from the clever design store that was to be dispatched to the department of trade and foreign affairs um and was going overseas now i can't be 100 percent sure about this but we were fairly confident between us that that they were going to be used for perhaps uh, an ambassador's residence or some such place uh, overseas so that was quite a scoop I've never seen them myself, um, but that was quite exciting early on. Um, I suppose, uh, where have I seen them? Um, I mean, locally, we've got the new Zespri headquarters um, where there are quite a selection of them uh, uh, visible from the street uh, in the sort of staff restaurant uh, and gathering area. Um, 
We have some in uh, a couple of hotels in Auckland, in foyers there, some of the lamps. Uh, Grace Hospital here in Tauranga have a good display in their entrance foyer. Um, and I'm, I'm aware of others, but I haven't seen them. I haven't necessarily been there in, in person. Uh, but yeah, various restaurants and uh, so on around uh, around the country, really. Yeah. Must have been very, um, very heartening and um, to see, you know, when someone's not just chosen your product, but when you get to see it in the broader context of all the other design elements that you have no control over mm. and think, oh, that's interesting how they've um, they've worked the, that group together of lighting and uh, furniture or lighting and space. Do you, does that ever reflect back on um, thinking about what the next set of products is going to be? Um, to be honest, uh, not really. It's um, as far as the lighting has gone, uh, we've developed iterations of, of essentially the same design so far. Sometimes I'm, I find myself caught between wanting to move away from lighting and back more towards furniture um, and ha household sort of items. Um, and then thinking, well, you know, lighting is really what I've become known for. Um, so perhaps I should capitalize on that. And then I'm struck when I do give some thought <clears throat> to that of, of actually how difficult it would be for me to come up with another design that's not this design that's as simple, um, hasn't been done already, and can still be um, manufactured here. And um, because essentially I work in wood, wood is my uh, my background. Um, so I don't tend to think, I'm not a product designer by profession, so I don't tend to think in terms of various other metals and plastics and materials like that um well, not so readily anyway not so easily and of course with lighting you've got uh quite significant compliance uh hurdles to jump mm. through as well electrically um and that was another part of the journey and it's it's expensive i mean that was the one biggest you know, single investment i probably had to make on on the journey so far was the compliance one um and that would, would face you with any new design. And that put me off for a while. That put me off the idea of doing a new, a different lighting product. Uh, more recently, I can see that, you know, the, it seems like a lot of money at the time, but once you've jumped through that hoop, which is quite a lot of work as well, actually, it's not just the money. Um, those those uh, barriers are actually, uh, although they're they're hard for you as the business owner at the time, they create barriers for others that decide they want to do what you're doing, either in investment as a barrier or mm. time to gain the accreditation. Mm. So once you're on the other side of it, you're actually you're you're further ahead than any competitor who decides this is something they would like to do. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I hadn't, I hadn't actually really thought of it like that before, but it's true. And I, I am aware of another New Zealand designer whose lights I liked very much. Um, uh, also, he was with the Clever Design Store, and at a certain point, he, he just pulled the product because he obviously had reached a point where he thought the, the compliance. You, 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 there are certain limited numbers you are allowed to produce as, as mm -hmm. kind of entry-level designs without going through the compliance hurdle. Um, but after a certain point, uh, that path has to, you know, that, that hoop has to be jumped through. And he apparently just felt that he either didn't have the money or wasn't willing to invest the money and time to do that and just literally pulled, pulled his products off the market. Um, That's interesting. It, sh it shows that when you get into those different stages, that different strata, uh, you move away from potential competitors that don't want to take those steps. And it almost mm. then speaks to looking for the hard route, actually looking for what's the complex, most uh, red tape that you could go through 
in order to put yourself in a position that that's you know beneficial for consumers as well but puts you in a position that maybe not of other not a lot of others would want to follow yes yeah yeah no it's you put that well that's interesting mm. we're next for the business uh it's 2020 now uh what what's the year that you're you're going to launch your first uh bespoke cabinet made skilled uh piece of furniture that that isn't hanging from the ceiling yeah quite um well every year i think this is going to be the year <laughs> <laughs> uh lockdown um gave us some breathing space where that really felt like that was going to become possible um uh right now i'm feeling that that may be challenged once again because uh as we've come out of the the uh the various levels of lockdown uh i think uh i'm definitely not alone in this i think the whole retail industry has uh um, experienced a, a huge kind of uh, post lockdown almost buying frenzy it seems to have just gone crazy so in these last few weeks um really we've been under the pump completely and um more so than i've ever been and uh you you just suddenly any aspirations or ideas to do anything else at all um take the dog for a walk even (laughs) is is, uh kind of out of the window right now um but i am not foolhardy enough to feel that that's necessarily going to last um that may be a bit of a a reaction um and you know the economic times ahead are, are, are somewhat uncertain um with that in mind i mean during the lockdown uh, myself and my wife did have a bit of a, a time to to make a bit of a strategic plan i suppose of where we would like to go you know, notwithstanding the economy. Um, and really, uh, as far as the lights go, um, we, uh, late last year, we started some relationships with some retailers in Australia. So we're hoping to build on that. Um, and beyond that, uh, probably looking at America and possibly Japan as other potential markets so to to over the next year or two to to perhaps take the the product further afield um might in involved in some design shows uh and you know marketing trips to those places and one of the reasons i choose those places apart from them having huge markets is that um there are good freight uh connections at, at reasonable prices to those destinations which there just aren't to to some other places or most other places so as far as the lights go that's the plan and as far as other products go i am really keen to 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 try and um bring some new stuff out uh some different stuff uh, essentially I, i've got a raft of ideas in my head some of them are on paper they all have the same theme which uh is in common with the lights themselves which is that they uh will use natural materials um materials that one of my biggest uh ambitions is to not create things that look good on look their best on the day you buy them and subsequently look gradually worse they should go the other way they should actually look better and better as time goes on like whether that. or not they get whether or not they get a chip or a scratch um or, or uh, some kind of stain or something that that should only actually add to the quality of it and that involves using usually just natural materials or, or good materials um so th- that would be a common theme through anything i'm thinking of producing i like that that's the whole patina approach that as things age they actually gain character through however whatever life they've experienced yeah and the the idea is that they become more rewarding as time goes on whereas so many things we buy 
these days become more disappointing and frustrating the longer we have them. They stop working, um, they rattle, they get a chip, and what's underneath the chip is horrible or it blows out with water or yeah, all these things that are just uh, a disappointment to you really uh, after you've spent your hard-earned money on them. Uh, so that that's that that's a common ambition for anything that I would be producing, and I'm also very interested in the whole uh, cradle to cradle design um, uh, ethic, I suppose, uh, which may not be familiar to everyone. But cradle to cradle is a, a, co- a term coined by a couple of Dutch designers in the 90s, and it's effectively uh, a design ethic where they're in its purest form there's no such thing as rubbish you the, the product can could be thrown out of your car window as you're di- driving along the road and it could in no real sense be thought of as rubbish in, any more than um uh you know petals from a cherry tree are rubbish on the on the tree when they on the ground when they fall off the tree um uh, it's a beautiful idea. It's at this stage quite ambitious, but um, I would like to produce things that are uh, attempting more, more and more to be faithful to that. Not because I think uh, my volume of sales is making a huge impact on the environment, but because I would like to promote the idea and promote the the way of that way of thinking in in my products. Uh, and I think it's the way that in the, all industries need to be orientating themselves. And an, an example of that would be, um, for example, even the plywood, the plywood we use is untreated. It's a natural pine. Um, it's still plywood, which in the current industry um, uses a, a kind of formaldehyde glue to bond the layers together. Now, just that addition um of a of a man-made glue means that uh i myself can't put the scraps into my wood burner at Mm -hmm. home um they can't be composted and they have to go to landfill likewise all the sawdust and everything else Uh, there are potential options to take them to a incineration facility that could potentially produce some power but that's about the only uh useful thing you could do with the waste now if if the glue uh could be switched to a soy based glue um for example mm. you've suddenly got a completely cradle to cradle item um, so that's something i've been exploring there are a couple of people in new zealand pursuing that uh, uh, I, I think it's worth framework. doing looking into those uh i mean as you said it it may not make a huge uh, environmental impact or, or for your footprint as such, mm. uh, but for the organizations, particularly the large corporates that are outfitting new buildings um, or, or the, you know, the, the Kiwi that has these, uh, this ethos, uh, when you imbue that into your product and it's at its core to what you believe, then it will attract the types of customers that also have that ethos. And that in itself becomes uh, almost a a corridor between what you're expressing through your work and what they want to express through their purchase. Absolutely. And and, Mm. and it may not be a big footprint, but I think the, the story has a massive ripple effect when you see products like that installed in, in very large corporates, whether it's, you know, Zespri or someone else who's watching this right now and thinks, actually, I'm going to get some um, Maker Design Studio lights for the next specification for a, for a large public space that I'm building. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that would be the idea. And, and of course, the extrapolation, if, if they start producing a plywood that is completely degradable in that way, uh, of course, I'll be using them for my lights, but uh, by the same extension you know that could be used commercially in in large-scale building products and uh, be a game changer then then you then you're starting to have big impacts so i think the more the more whether you're small like us or big if it, the more people that are, that are raising awareness about that potential avenue um the better 
and it's a fascinating i mean there's a great book a short book written about it because it, it's fascinating because industry resists these things often on a cost basis and mm. the cost basis is usually the headline cost of of the actual alternative product uh, but very often there are huge cost savings because now you no longer need your your, your employees no longer need to wear um, protective gloves or uh, ventilator masks because there are no dangerous fumes coming off these things or um, you don't have to pay for special waste management because uh, of various chemicals and that kind of thing so there are a whole raft of underlying cost savings um, that make make the whole thing quite viable and it, what you realize is it's often just a change of, of headset and so that's what I would be keen to participate in, in um, uh, bringing, bringing about a change in, yeah. Well, it's great to hear the backstory uh, to your business and your ethos of, of what you want and are bringing into the world. And I really appreciate you sharing your story today with the New Zealand Made group and to our broader set of New Zealand Made fans, which over the last few weeks has increased significantly with the the post COVID move to actually supporting <clears throat> and buying local from people we recognize from the stories that resonate with us. Uh, and I hope you do get some uh, more interest for the products you're making as a result of this podcast for, for people that are, are listening, what's the best place for them to go and either see or, or purchase your, your lighting range? Well, we have uh, something around 15 to 18 retail showrooms displaying a small selection of, of our lights around the country. The best place uh, to look for that is on our website, uh, which lists all the all the current ones. Um, is that, um, that's makerdesignstudio.co.nz? That's right, yeah. Um, we, we do not attempt to... Uh, tread on the toes of our retailers so we don't offer a buying platform for retail on our website but it will show you where you can uh, we do sell direct to to uh, commercial architects and interior designers uh, so the website is is a good as good a place as any to go for images um, and really if people want to see the product uh, if they're not close to one of the shops or maybe they want to see it in, in, in situ somewhere, they can always give me a call and I may know of something in their area, a hotel, foyer, uh, perhaps a restaurant, cafe, something like that, where they might, might be able to just pop in and have a look. Um, Where's one in Wellington? Wellington, off the top of my head, I can't think. I'd probably have to come back to you. I'd be able to find <laughs> something. But... Uh, because uh, I have seen them on your Instagram, and uh, I'd like to see how they throw throw light in person. Yeah, uh, actually, no. There is there is a hotel, and I would have to remember the name, but it's one of the hotels quite near the waterfront that has them in their conference room on the first floor, which I think would be quite available for people to see. Um, is that the right QT now, Hotel? I would have to check. It's been okay. two or three years since they were ordered, so I would need to check i can't quite remember off the top of my head yeah i'll um if you get it back to me on what a couple of those places are maybe i'll put them in the the podcast show notes so that oh yeah um, no problem the links yeah. are there yeah lovely very good well thank you very much for your time today matt and uh appreciate you sharing your story and we'll, we'll get this up on all the different channels so we can get your story out there great uh ryan thank you very much thanks for inviting me and it's been uh been a real pleasure you're welcome. Enjoy the rest of your day. This has been a Kiwi original brought to you by the New Zealand Made team. Thanks for watching. Uh, the New Zealand Made trademark is used by over 1,200 businesses in New Zealand. Uh, the New Zealand Made team licenses that trademark. Check if you're eligible at buynz.org.nz. If you feel that someone should see this, share it with them now. Otherwise, subscribe to youtube.com forward slash buynzmade and we'll see you on the next episode.